Chapters 1 and 2 of The Abysmal Brute. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The Abysmal Brute by Jack London. Chapter 1 sam stubner ran through his mail carelessly and rapidly as became a manager of prize fighters he was accustomed to a various and bizarre correspondence every crank sport near sport and reformer seemed to have ideas to impart to him from dire threats against his life to milder threats such as pushing in the front of his face from rabbit foot fetishes to lucky horseshoes, from dinky jerkwater bids to the quarter of a million dollar offers of irresponsible nobodies, he knew the whole run of the surprise portion of his mail. In his time, having received a razor strop made from the skin of a lynched negro, and a finger, withered and sun dried, cut from the body of a white man found in death valley he was of the opinion that never again would the postman bring him anything that could startle him but this morning he opened a letter that he read a second time put away in his pocket and took out for a third reading it was postmarked from some unheard of post office in siskiyou county and it ran dear sam you don't know me except my reputation you come after my time and i've been out of the game a long time but take it from me i ain't been asleep i've followed the whole game and i've followed you from the time cal offman knocked you out to your last handling of nat belson and i take it you're the niftiest thing in the line of managers that ever came down the pike i got a proposition for you i got the greatest unknown that ever happened this ain't con it's the straight goods what do you think of a husky that tips the scales at two hundred and twenty pounds fighting weight is twenty-two years old and can hit a kick twice as hard as my best ever that's him my boy young pat glendon that's the name he'll fight under i've planned it all out now the best thing you can do is hit the first train and come up here i bred him and i trained him all that i ever had in my head i've hammered into his and maybe you won't believe it but he's added to it he's a born fighter he's a wonder at time and distance he just knows to the second and the inch and he don't have to think about it at all his six-inch jolt is more the real sleep medicine than the full arm swing of most geezers talk about the hope of the white race this is him come and take a peep when you was managing jeffries you was crazy about hunting come along and i'll give you some real hunting and fishing that will make your moving picture winnings look like thirty cents i'll send young pat out with you i ain't able to get around that's why i'm sending for you i was going to manage him myself but it ain't no use i'm all in and likely to pass out any time so get a move on i want you to manage him there's a fortune in it for both of you but i want to draw up the contract yours truly pat glendon stubner was puzzled it seemed on the face of it a joke the men in the fighting game were notorious jokers and he tried to discern the fine hand of corbett or the big friendly paw of fitzsimmons in the screed before him but if it were genuine he knew it was worth looking into pat glendon was before his time though as a cub 
he had once seen old pat spar at the benefit for jack dempsey even then he was called old pat and had been out of the ring for years he had antedated sullivan and the old london prize ring rules though his last fading battles had been put up under the incoming marquis of queensberry rules what ring follower did not know of pat glendon though few were alive who had seen him in his prime and there were not many more who had seen him at all yet his name had come down in the history of the ring and no sporting writer's lexicon was complete without it his fame was paradoxical no man was honored higher and yet he had never attained championship honors he had been unfortunate and had been known as the unlucky fighter four times he all but won the heavyweight championship and each time he had deserved to win it there was the time on the barge in san francisco bay when at the moment he had the champion going he snapped his own forearm and on the island in the thames sloshing about in six inches of rising tide he broke a leg at a similar stage in a winning fight in texas too there was the never-to-be-forgotten day when the police broke in just as he had his man going in all certainty and finally there was the fight in the mechanics pavilion in san francisco when he was secretly jobbed from the first by a gunfighting bad man of a referee backed by a small syndicate of betters pat glendon had had no accidents in that fight but when he had knocked his man cold with a right to the jaw and a left to the solar plexus the referee calmly disqualified him for fouling every ringside witness every sporting expert and the whole sporting world knew there had been no foul yet like all fighters pat glendon had agreed to abide by the decision of the referee pat abided and accepted it as in keeping with the rest of his bad luck this was pat glendon what bothered stubner was whether or not pat had written the letter he carried it downtown with him what's become of pat glendon such was his greeting to all sports that morning nobody seemed to know some thought he must be dead but none knew positively the fight editor of a morning daily looked up the records and was able to state that his death had not been noted it was from tim donovan that he got a clue sure and he ain't dead said donovan how could that be a man of his make that never boozed or blew himself he made money and what's more he saved it and invested it didn't he have three saloons at the one time and wasn't he making slathers of money with them when he sold out now that i'm thinking that was the last time i laid eyes on him when he sold them out it was all of twenty years and more ago his wife had just died i met him heading for the ferry where away old sport says i it's me for the woods says he i've quit good-bye tim me boy and i've never seen him from that day to this of course he ain't dead you say when his wife died did he have any children stubner queried one a little baby he was lugging it in his arms that very day was it a boy how should i be knowing it was then that sam stubner reached a decision and that night found him in a pullman speeding toward the wilds of northern california chapter two stubner was dropped off the overland at deer lick in the early morning and he kicked his heels for an hour before the one saloon opened its doors no the saloon keeper didn't know anything about pat glendon had never heard of him and if he was in that part of the country he must be out beyond somewhere neither had the one hanger-on ever heard of pat glendon 
at the hotel the same ignorance obtained and it was not until the storekeeper and postmaster opened up that stubner struck the trail oh yes pack london lived out beyond you took the stage at alpine which was forty miles and which was a logging camp from alpine on horseback you rode up antelope valley and crossed the divide to bear creek pack london lived somewhere beyond that the people at alpine would know yes there was a young pat the storekeeper had seen him he had been in to deer lick two years back old pat had not put in an appearance for five years he bought his supplies at the store and always paid by check and he was a white-haired strange old man that was all the storekeeper knew but the folks at alpine could give him directions it looked good to stubner beyond doubt there was a young pat clendon as well as an old one living out beyond that night the manager spent at the logging camp of alpine and early the following morning he rode a mountain cayuse up antelope valley he rode over the divide and down bear creek he rode all day through the wildest roughest country he had ever seen and at sunset turned up pinto valley on a trail so stiff and narrow that more than once he elected to get off and walk it was eleven o'clock when he dismounted before a log cabin and was greeted by the baying of two huge deer hounds then pat glendon opened the door fell on his neck and took him in i knew you'd come sam me boy said pat the while he limped about building a fire boiling coffee and frying a big bear steak the young un ain't home the night we was getting short of meat and he went out about sundown to pick up a deer but i'll say no more wait till you see him he'll be home in the morn and then you can try him out there's the gloves but wait till you see him as for me i'm finished eighty-one come next january and pretty good for an ex-bruiser but i never wasted meself sam nor kept late hours and burned the candle at all ends i had a damn good candle and made the most of it as you'll grant at looking at me and i've taught the same to the young un what do you think of a lad of twenty-two that's never had a drink in his life nor tasted tobacco that's him he's a giant and he's lived natural all his days wait till he takes you out after deer he'll break your heart travelling light him a carrying the outfit and a big buck deer belike he's a child of the open air and winter nor summer has he slept under a roof the open for him as i taught him the one thing that worries me is how he'll take to sleeping in houses and how he'll stand the tobacco smoke of the ring tis a terrible thing that smoke when you're fighting hard and gasping for air but no more sam me boy you're tired and sure should be sleeping wait till you see him that's all wait till you see him but the garrulousness of age was on old pat and it was long before he permitted stubner's eyes to close he can run a deer down with his own legs that young un he broke out again tis the dandy training for the lungs the hunter's life he don't know much of else though he's read a few books at times and poetry stuff he's just plain pure natural as you'll see when you clap eyes on him he's got the old irish strong in him sometimes the way he moons about it's thinking strong i am that he believes in the fairies and such like he's a nature lover if ever there was one and he's afeard of cities he's read about em but the biggest he was ever in was dear lick he misliked the many people and his report was that they'd stand weedin out that was two years agone the first and the last time he's seen a locomotive and a train of cars sometimes it's wrong i'm thinkin i am bringing him up a natural it's givin him wind and stamina and a strength of wild bulls no city-grown man can have a look in against him 
I'm willing to grant that Jeffreys, at his best, could have worried the young'un a bit, but only a bit. The young'un could have broke him like a straw. And he don't look it. That's the everlasting wonder of it. He's only a fine-seeming young husky, but it's the quality of his muscle that's different. But wait till you see him, that's all. A strange liking the boy has for posies and little meadows. A bit of pine with the moon beyond. Windy sunsets are the sun of morns from the top of old Baldy. And he has a hankerin for the drawing of pictures of things and of spouting about Lucifer or night from the poetry books he got from the red-headed schoolteacher. But tis only his youngness. He'll settle down to the game once we get him started. But watch out for grouches when he first comes to living in a city for him. A good thing. He's woman-shy. They'll not bother him for years. He can't bring himself to understand the creatures. And damn few of them has he seen at that. Twas the schoolteacher over at Samson's flat that put the poetry stuff in his head. She was clean daffy over the young'un, and he never a knowin. A warm-haired girl she was, not a mountain girl, but from down in the flatlands. And as time went by, she was fair desperate, and the way she went after him was shameless. And what do you think the boy did when he tumbled to it? He was scared as a jackrabbit. He took blankets and ammunition and hiked for tall timber. Not for a month did I lay eyes on him, and then he sneaked in after dark and was gone in the morn. Nor would he as much as peep at her letters. Burn him, he said, and burn him I did. Twice she rode over on a cayuse all the way from Samson's flat, and I was sorry for the young creature. She was fair hungry for the boy, and she looked it in her face. And at the end of three months she gave up school and went back to her own country. And then it was that the boy came home to the shack to live again. Women have been the ruination of many a good fighter, but they won't be of him. He blushes like a girl if anything young in skirts looks at him a second time, or too long the first one. And they all look at him. But when he fights, when he fights, God, it's the old savage Irish that flares in him and drives the fists of him. Not that he goes off his base. Don't walk away with that. At my best I was never as cool as he. I missed out. Twas the wrath of me that brought the accident. But he's an iceberg. He's hot and cold at the one time, a live wire in an ice chest. Stubner was dozing when the old man's mumble aroused him. He listened drowsily. I made a man of him, by God. I made a man of him, with the two fists of him, and the upstanding legs of him, and the straight seeing eyes. And I know the game in my head, and I've kept up with the times and the modern changes. The crouch? Sure, he knows all the styles and economies. He never moves two inches when an inch and a half will do the turn. And when he wants, he can spring like a buck kangaroo. In fightin'? Wait till you see. Better than his out fightin'. And he could sure have sparred with Peter Jackson and outfooted Corbett at his best. I tell you, I've taught him it all, to the last trick. And he's improved on the teaching. He's a fair genius at the game. And he's had plenty of husky mountain men to try out on. I gave him the fancy work, and they gave him the slogging. Nothing shy or delicate about them. Roaring bulls and big grizzly bears, that's what they are, when it comes to hugging in a clinch or swinging rough-like in the rushes. And he plays with them. Man, do you hear me? He plays with them, like you and me would play with little puppy dogs. Another time Stubner awoke to hear the old man mumbling. "'Tis the funny thing he don't take fightin' seriously. It's that easy to him he thinks it's play. But wait till he's tapped a swift one. That's all wait. And you'll see him throw on the juice in that cold storage plant of his and turn loose the prettiest scientific wallopin' that ever you laid eyes on. In the shivery gray of mountain dawn, Stubner was routed from his blankets by old Pat. He's coming up the trail now, was the hoarse whisper. Out with ye and take your first peep at the biggest fightin' man the ring has ever seen, or will ever see in a thousand years again.
the manager peered through the open door rubbing the sleep from his heavy eyes and saw a young giant walk into the clearing in one hand was a rifle across his shoulders a heavy deer under which he moved as if it were weightless he was dressed roughly in blue overalls and a woolen shirt open at the throat coat he had none and on his feet instead of brogans were moccasins stubner noted that his walk was smooth and cat-like without suggestion of his two hundred and twenty pounds of weight to which that of the deer was added the fight manager was impressed from the first glimpse formidable the young fellow certainly was but the manager sensed the strangeness and unusualness of him he was a new type something different from the run of fighters he seemed a creature of the wild more a night roaming figure from some old fairy story or folk tale than a twentieth century youth a thing stubner quickly discovered was that young pat was not much of a talker he acknowledged old pat's introduction with a grip of the hand but without speech and silently set to work at building the fire and getting breakfast to his father's direct questions he answered in monosyllables as for instance when asked where he had picked up the deer south fork was all he vouchsafed eleven miles across the mountains the old man exposited pridefully to stubner and a trail that'd break your heart breakfast consisted of black coffee sourdough bread and an immense quantity of bear meat broiled over the coals of this the young fellow ate ravenously and stubner divined that both the glendons were accustomed to an almost straight meat diet old pat did all the talking though it was not till the meal was ended that he broached the subject he had at heart pat boy he began you know who the gentleman is young pat nodded and cast a quick comprehensive glance at the manager well he'll be taking you away with him and down to san francisco i'd sooner stay here dad was the answer stubner felt a prick of disappointment it was a wild goose chase after all this was no fighter eager and fretting to be at it his huge brawn counted for nothing it was nothing new it was the big fellows that usually had the streak of fat but old pat's celtic wrath flared up and his voice was harsh with command you'll go down to the cities and fight me boy that's what i've trained you for and you'll do it all right was the unexpected response rumbled apathetically from the deep chest and fight like hell the old man added again stubner felt disappointment at the absence of flash and fire in the young man's eyes as he answered all right when do we start oh sam here he'll be wantin a little huntin and to fish a bit as well as to try you out with the gloves he looked at sam who nodded suppose you strip and give him a taste of your quality an hour later sam stubner had his eyes opened an ex-fighter himself a heavyweight at that he was even a better judge of fighters and never had he seen one strip to like advantage see the softness of him old pat chanted tis the true stuff look at the slope of the shoulders and the lungs of him clean all clean to the last drop an ounce of him you're looking at a man sam the like of which was never seen before not a muscle of him bound no weight lifter or sandow exercise artist there see the fat snakes of muscles a-crawlin soft and lazy like wait do you see them flashin like a strikin rattler he's good for forty rounds this blessed instant or a hundred go to it time they went to it for three minute rounds with a minute rests and sam stubner was immediately undeceived here was no streak of fat no apathy only a lazy good-natured play of gloves and tricks 
with a brusque stiffness and harsh sharpness in the contacts that he knew belonged only to the trained and instinctive fighting man easy now easy old pat warned sam's not the man he used to be this nettled sam as it was intended to do and he played his most famous trick and favorite punch a feint for a clinch and a right rip to the stomach but quickly as it was delivered young pat saw it and though it landed his body was going away the next time his body did not go away as the rip started he moved forward and twisted his left hip to meet it it was only a matter of several inches yet it blocked the blow and thereafter try as he would stubner's glove got no farther than that hip stubner had roughed it with big men in his time and in exhibition bouts had creditably held his own but there was no holding his own here young pat played with him and in the clinches made him feel as powerful as a baby landing on him seemingly at will locking and blocking with masterful accuracy and scarcely noticing or acknowledging his existence half the time young pat seemed to spend in gazing off and out at the landscape in a dreamy sort of way and right here stubner made another mistake he took it for a trick of old pat's training tried to sneak in a short arm jolt found his arm in a lightning lock and had both his ears cuffed for his pains the instinct for a blow the old man chortled tis not put on i'm tellin you he's a whiz he knows a blow without the lookin when it starts and where the speed and space and niceness of it and tis nothing i ever showed him tis inspiration he was so born once in a clinch the fight manager healed his glove on young pat's mouth and there was just a hint of viciousness in the manner of doing it a moment later in the next clinch sam received the heel of the other's glove on his own mouth there was nothing snappy about it but the pressure stolidly lazy as it was put his head back till the joints cracked and for the moment he thought his neck was broken he slacked his body and dropped his arms in token that the bout was over felt the instant release and staggered clear he'll he'll do he gasped looking the admiration he lacked the breath to utter old pat's eyes were brightly moist with pride and triumph and what you'll be thinking to happen when some of the gay and ugly ones tries to rough it on him he asked he'll kill them sure was stubner's verdict no he's too cool for that but he'll just hurt them some for their dirtiness let's draw up the contract said the manager wait till you know the whole worth of him old pat answered tis strong terms i'll be making you come to go for a deer hunt with the boy over the hills and learn the lungs and the legs of him then we'll sign up ironclad and regular stubner was gone two days on that hunt and he learned all and more than old pat had promised and came back a very weary and very humble man the young fellow's innocence of the world had been startling to the case-hardened manager but he had found him nobody's fool virgin though his mind was untouched by all save a narrow mountain experience nevertheless he had proved possession of a natural keenness and shrewdness far beyond the average in a way he was a mystery to sam who could not understand his terrible equanimity of temper nothing ruffled him or worried him and his patience was of an enduring primitiveness he never swore not even the futile and emasculated cuss words of sissy boys i'd swear all right if i wanted to he had explained when challenged by his companion but i guess i've never come to needing it when i do i'll swear i suppose old pat resolutely adhering to his decision 
said goodbye at the cabin. It won't be long, Pat boy, when I'll be reading about you in the papers. I'd like to go along, but I'm afeard it's me for the mountains till the end. And then, drawing the manager aside, the old man turned loose on him almost savagely. Remember what I've been telling you over and over. The boy's clean and he's honest. He knows nothing of the rottenness of the game. I kept it all away from him, I tell you. He don't know the meaning of fake. He knows only the bravery and romance and glory of fighting. And I've filled him up with tales of the old ring heroes. Though little enough, God knows, it set him afire. Man, man, I'm telling you that I clipped the fight columns from the newspapers to keep it away from him. Him a-thinking I was wanting them for me scrapbook. He don't know a man ever lay down or through a fight. So don't you get him in anything that ain't straight. Don't turn the boy's stomach. That's why I put in the null and void clause. The first rottenness, and the contract's broke of itself. No snide division of stake money, no secret arrangements with the moving picture men for guaranteed distance. There's slathers of money for the both of you. But play it square, or you lose, understand? And whatever you'll be doing, watch out for the women, was old Pat's parting admonishment. Young Pat astride his horse, and reining in dutifully to hear. Women is death and damnation, remember that. But when you do find the one, the only one, hang on to her. She'll be worth more than glory and money. But first be sure, and when you're sure, don't let her slip through your fingers. Grab her with the two hands of you and hang on, hang on if all the world goes to smash and smithereens. Pat, boy, a good woman is a good woman. Tis the first word in the last. End of chapters 1 and 2